Han Lee is an award-winning technology entrepreneur and business executive and founder and CEO of Emotive, a bioinformatics company focused on advancing understanding of the human brain. Today, Emotive's award-winning technology is a recognized world leader and pioneer in this field of brain-computer interface with developers and researchers in over 100 countries. Tan was recently named a National Geographic Emerging Explorer. She has also been featured in the Who's Who in Australia list, Fast Company's Most Influential Women in Technology, and Forbes' 50 Names You Need to Know. Tan serves on the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on Neurotechnology and Brain Sciences. We had the privilege of having Tan this year at her win session at Inforum. After the session, she sat down with me for a fireside chat so that she could share her personal side with the WIN community. Tan, we are so, so excited to have you at our WIN session this year at Inforum. Thank this you. It's going to happen in a couple of hours' time, and thank you for taking the time to do some one-on-one -on -one so conversation. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank Fantastic. You. I'm going to start with your um, your bio, if you will, because I know if I ask you, you will be too shy and you be very <laughs> humble about it. So you're an award-winning technology entrepreneur. You're the founder and CEO of Emotive, a bioinformatics company focused on understanding the human brain. You were recently named National Geographic's Emerging Explorer. You've been featured in the Who's Who's list. You're in the Forbes 50 Names You Need to Know. I could go on. <laughs> Thank you. So tell us, tell us about the young Tan Lee and, and how, you, how you came to be so successful and you know, was everything you know, landed to you on a plate? Just, just give us some background about how, how you came to be this successful entrepreneur. And I, I think that so much of um, who we are is, is a layering experience, right? And so, so much of what we become is a product of our experiences. And so uh, I was, when I, in many ways, I see myself as being very lucky because I was, I was born an outsider. When, um, my fa when I was born, um, my country, Vietnam, was in turmoil and we were ousted from our own country. We had to leave on a little boat um, and we really didn't know what the future had to hold. And then once we landed in our new home, Australia, we were again outsiders and um, trying to start over in, a, in a, an environment, in a single parent household. My mum had two little kids to look after and a, an aging parent. So it was very difficult on her. And I, that was the backdrop um, that I grew up in. And that really helped to, um, for me in many ways, to learn about courage and resilience at a very early age, watching her, you know, uh, confront the challenges that she faced, but also learning how important it is is to actually adapt to your environment, to the situation, uh, and not be rigid. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I've learned is that my mother, it wasn't about bouncing back um, so much as bouncing forward. So for her, it was not going back to what she was, but defining what a new sense of her purpose was going to be in this new world. And that was very important to me, and I, I think that that's helped me so much in as a guiding principle right. in how I frame my life and how I think about new opportunities as well as challenges that, that I get thrown at um, from time to time because it all seems relatively pale in comparison to what she has had to, to put up true. with. Yeah, Yeah, you've spoken a lot about the role of, of women in your life and obviously you're very um, attached. Uh, obviously you, you, you've had a great values and principles given to you by, by, by your family. And um, that's been a strong motivator, obviously, as well for everything that you've done. So why bioinformatics and, and brain augmentation? I think that the, there are a few macro environments that are really important at any point in history. Um, the, the first thing is that we are advancing medical science at a rapid pace. And unfortunately, the brain is a system that we cannot replace yet. Right, we yeah. don't know how we can possibly replace it. And so it's very important to actually understand and extend the life of our brain as we live much, much longer lives. And yet today, the way that we study brains is very limiting. Mm -hmm. We study brains typically when something's wrong. And mm -hmm. so um, we don't really have any sort of idea of what a normative baseline looks like. And because the brain is an adaptive organ, it changes over the course of life it's very difficult to study something as if 
it's stagnant mm -hmm. as if you can take one snapshot one data point mm -hmm. and assume that that's okay to mm -hmm. get a glimpse into how that dynamic system has evolved to to get there just mm -hmm. in the same way as a human life evolves and you get there as a as a uh, jigsaw puzzle of all of the, the experiences you've had, the same thing with the brain. It's a, it's a mixture of different connections that have formed over the course of a very long life. And so it's very important to be able to study that longitudinally. Mm -hmm. And today with machine learning, with artificial intelligence, we need to be able to, we can, we have the capacity to consume vast amounts of data about the brain in order to piece together information that otherwise wouldn't be available. We also have at our disposal um, um, portable devices that provide very deep contextual information mm. and so it creates a backdrop for very powerful ways in which we can um, see our relationship to the brain and really redefine that because I believe that the next generation of computing is really about tapping directly into mm. the source right mm -hmm. you know right now we have lots of ways um, analogs to 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 manipulate our environments that are a kind of like a one step or th several mm. steps removed from the, the source itself but if we can tap directly into the source then we get a very rich amount of complex information mm -hmm. whether it be about your emotional experiences about your cognition mm -hmm. about your attention your focus about how you feel there's so many different mm -hmm. things that that we can tap into that is just not available right now just looking at heart rate or right. looking at what you we explicitly express Wow. So doing everything that you're doing and working with the researchers that you are in the field on the brain, because as you said, it really you know, is the last frontier. What are the things you're seeing that we will solve for in, in the years ahead with respect to you know, whether it's Alzheimer's or effectively bringing cognitive to AI? What are the things that I, you... Yeah, that's a, that's a big question. I think that there are many things and it won't just be what we do mm -hmm. today which is based on non-invasive technology but as we look at the landscape going out a decade from mm -hmm. now looking at both a combination of neurostimulation neuromodulation plus some form of invasive techno right. forms of technology I see it replacing our basic interfaces that we we already have right? right so you will be able to seamlessly walk through your environment it will understand intuitively what you want what your experiences are what you, what your past experiences mm -hmm. were as well as be able to understand based on your specific mix your experiences people you've seen your genetic makeup what the likelihood of specific types of conditions are whether it mm -hmm. be dementia whether you're having some anxiety that could cause you know long term stress is very debilitating right so modulating your pro productivity cycles so that you can perform at your peak at all times and then having enough rest periods to really understand how to recover from that right? so the, that the idea of humans um, not understanding our own data, data right. in order to really optimize our own performance is i think something that's uh, that's only we're just on the cusp of solving cusp a of lot that. of that. Yeah. yeah, it's fascinating. It's really fascinating. So let me ask you, what advice would you give to somebody starting out in their career today in technology, in your, in your space, in your field? I think the key now is really about adaptation. Um, you know, technology is transforming our landscape so mm -hmm. rapidly and with autonomy automation that's going yeah. to happen so there, there will be a massive amount of disruption um, you know the, the meaning of work the meaning of jobs will change and mm -hmm. will be radically transformed so the role of humans in that context will evolve so much in mm -hmm. the next decade and 20 years I mean I can't even fathom what it would be to live 20 mm. years from yeah. now because I can see the radical transformations the all around yeah. us and yeah. that means that in order for us to really be successful mm. in the future we need to be comfortable with technologies and te comfortable with adaptation right comfortable with the changing environment being able to learn the underlying mechanics of mm -hmm. how these technologies work, work and then being able to adapt ourselves to it because it's it, I think rapid flexibility and adaptation is going to be really the key to any successful um, human in that that future world because without without that I just don't think we'll be able to stay 
um, ahead of the of the game. We may make ourselves redundant. We it's, <laughs> it's very likely that if we don't evolve fast enough, that there will be a lot more intelligence out there that will replace a lot of the fundamental mundane things that mm -hmm. that we okay. already do. So we need to find our our edge. Mm -hmm. Tana, it was fantastic speaking to you. Thank you. It's a pleasure.